Uh, well, thank you for having me. Um, and as, uh, as he mentioned, I am a student at Baylor University. And today I'm going to be uh, presenting on my research, which really focuses on problem solving with plants. But before I get into my research, I was told to give a little bit of information about myself, because uh, you guys are you know, considering where you, guys, where you want to go for your career. So it's good to know someone who's kind of been through the process. Uh, so for me, I got my uh, Bachelor of Science in Cell Biology and Physiology and a Spanish minor uh, at St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri back in 2013. Uh, back then, when I, I did research uh, as an undergrad, and so my past research experience, I used to work with uh, cancer vaccines. But now, obviously, that's not what I do. Nowadays, my current research is I work with uh, GMOs, plants, and mosquitoes. So the lesson to take from that is, you know, you may find that you're interested in one area of research. You get in there and then you realize, eh, that's not the area of research for me. That was my experience. So now I do something completely different. Um, but a lot of the biology concepts can still apply between both areas of research. So if you want to make a change, don't be afraid to make a change. So now I am a PhD student um, at Baylor University. And I do uh, research with uh, Dr. Uh, Chris Kearney um, at Baylor. Um, and as far as for what I want to do after I graduate, well, a lot of people, when you think, oh, you get your PhD, you're going to go on, you're going to become a professor at a university. Well, actually, that's not my end goal. I don't really want to go into academia. My goal, because I do biotech research, is I actually want to go into industry because there's a lot more freedom there for developing products and, you know, it pays more. So, you know, there are multiple options for biology majors other than just being a professor or uh, going to med school or any of those other uh, health professions. So that's something to keep in mind. So now uh, that's all I wanted to say about me. I'm going to talk about my research. So I mentioned that I do research with GMOs. So as you may know, uh, GMO stands for genetically modified organism. So when you, hear, when you hear the to the term GMO, what pops to mind for you guys? Like, what do you think of? Rice, any other examples? Yeah, those are good examples, but basically, generally what I hear is most people were talking about genetically modified plants. So you may have heard of like Monsanto, or you know, you might go into the grocery store and you see the term, oh, this plant is non-GMO. So a lot of people, when they think of genetically modified organisms, they think of plants. So as you can see here, this is a plant that has been modified to express a fluorescent protein. So that means that when it is exposed to uh, UV light, it glows green, which is pretty cool. Um, but GMO is actually a more general term. It refers to any organism that has been genetically modified, which can include bacteria, such as these bacteria that have been modified to also express this fluorescent protein. Bacteria can also be modified to express other things. Uh, for instance, uh, insulin, a lot of uh, synthetic insulin that people use to control diabetes is actually produced in bacteria so that it can be used for medication purposes. And then lastly, even other animals can actually be GMOs. So here we have a mouse that's been modified again to express this fluorescent protein. That's just one example, of course, why, are, why would we want to modify a mouse? Well, the reason for that is in medical research, mice are actually really good models for studying human disease. So if we can modify something in the mouse, that allows us to learn something about humans that we may not have known already. So GMOs have a lot of applications, but as you saw from the title, of my presentation, Problem Solving with Plants, I'm going to focus on the plants. So first of all, I want to start out, you know, most people, when they think of GMOs and these modifications, they think of directly inserting genes. But the truth is that humans have been doing plant modifications for thousands of years. So starting back, you know, 10,000 years ago, when humans first started domesticating crops, they started domesticating crops and doing selective breeding, and these actually caused genetic modifications. And this is what you can see here uh, with uh, the corn up here on the very top. This is what corn, wild corn, used to look like. And then this over here on the bottom, this is what modern corn looks like. So obviously something has changed between here and here. And those are genetic modifications that occurred because we went in and we selected, you know, selectively bred for larger and larger in corn to where we get from this size down to this size. But still, even though we were just breeding, we were causing genetic modifications. And so we continued these processes of uh, breeding these different plants. But the connection between this selective breeding um, and uh, genetics really came into play in the 1940s with Dr. Norman Borlaug, who was considered the father of the Green Revolution. He saw the connection between selective breeding and appropriate 
uh, you know, agriculture processes and ways of solving problems associated with plants. For instance, what he found is, you know, we can engineer these plants to be more drought resistant so that in areas that had really bad drought problems, um, they could have plants that were more um, hardy to where they would survive and then you wouldn't have really bad famines in countries like India. But then going on from there, since then we've figured out the genetic processes to go in and directly insert a gene as opposed to trying to, you know, mate all of these plants together and we're able to uh, actually include very specific genes. Uh, one example you probably heard of is the golden rice. So uh, golden rice, uh, you can clearly see the difference between the two. It has a gold color and the reason for that is, is what they did here is they went in and they specifically added a gene to increase the vitamin A content in the rice. And the reason they did this is because in a lot of countries that were relying on rice, vitamin A deficiency was a problem. And so they added this gene in in order to increase the nutritional value of the rice in order to prevent blindness from occurring. So as you can see, a lot of uh, applications in the history um, has been going on for a long time. So now that we know the history of uh, plant modifications, we'll go into nowadays what are the current practices that we use to make these modified plants. So for creating a transformed plant, there are a variety of methods that you can do. You can do biolistics, which uses a gene gun to actually like shoot the gene into the plant. You may have heard of CRISPR-Cas9, which is a very popular uh, editing mechanism that's used in both plants, but also even in human research. And then we can even use uh, bacteria to create uh, transformed plants. I'm going to focus on the bacterial exposure because this is the kind of research that I do. So how, does, how do you use bacteria to create transformed plants? Well, we use a specific bacteria that is known as Agrobacterium tumefaciens. This bacteria is a common plant pathogen. And what scientists noted is whenever they looked at an infection with this bacteria, the plant started to grow these tumor-like growths. And they were wondering, huh, that's interesting that the plant is growing extra tissue. I wonder what's causing that. So they analyzed the plant tissue, and what they found is that this bacteria was actually able to insert its own DNA into the plant's DNA. So it was actually directly editing the plant genome. And so these scientists were like, well, that's interesting, but I wonder if we could take advantage of that mechanism. And that's exactly what they did. So they found that the mechanism that was allowing the bacteria to insert its DNA inside of the plant is what's called this TI plasmid. So as you may know, in bacteria, they have their really large genomic DNA, and then they have their uh, plasmids, which are much smaller circular pieces of DNA. So they found that the mechanism for transformation was in uh, this particular plasmid, which you can see right here. And this plasmid has uh, specific recognition sequences that are called the left and the right border. And that's important because if we want to insert our gene of interest, to get expression of like say a green fluorescent protein, we wanna make sure that it's in between that left and the right border. So we do genetic cloning or genetic engineering in order to create our recombinant plasmid where we take this gene and we put it in between this left and the right border. And the reason it needs to be within those borders is once that gene is added into the, transformed into the bacteria, when we expose the plant, we infect the plant with the bacteria, only that left and right border actually gets carried into the plant because the bacteria have special enzymes that cut out just that piece and then directly insert it into the plant's genome. And then once it's inserted in the plant cell, you simply regrow the full plant and now you have a transformed plant. So that's how that process works. But going a little bit further, so now we know the process, what are the applications for it? Well, with agrobacterium, we can do what we call transient and transgenic expression. So what are the differences between those? Uh, transient expression is what you see visualized here, and this is actually what you guys are going to get to, you know, try out. You, of course, we won't be working with bacteria, you'll be working with water, but this is a technique you'll get to learn today. And the way it works is you have a fully adult plant. So in this case, this plant is Nicotiana benthamiana, which is a typical research plant that's used for this type of experiment. And the way it works is you have a syringe that is filled with the bacterial culture, and then you insert that bacterial culture into the plant, it spreads out from the, ins uh, the injection site, um, and then it's able to transform those cells and cause those cells to produce a particular protein that you're interested in. So you basically can turn them into little factories, and then seven to 12 days later, after you've done your injection, you can go in and actually harvest these proteins and then use them for uh, other research or maybe other medical applications. Whereas transgenic expression, 
Instead of working with an adult plant, we're working with what we call tissue culture. Uh, tissue culture are basically plant stem cells. What that means is these plants have not matured. They haven't decided what type of cell they want to be. So if we transform these stem cells, that means that any cells that come from those cells will also contain our gene of interest. And this the reason this is important is that it allows us to create a fully transformed plant that expresses our gene of interest in the stems, the leaves, the roots, the flowers, every single part of the plant. So it's very useful for creating fully transformed plants, but also if we can transform these stem cells, these plants will also be able to pass on these traits to their offspring through their seeds. So what does that look like? Well, transient expression, again, I like to use uh, GFP as a good example with the green fluorescence. Uh, you can get high expression in a short amount of time of these proteins. Uh, one thing you'll note is you can see parts of the leaves that aren't transformed. Because again, it's not going to fully transform the plant. It's only going to transform as far as it was able to spread inside of the plant. So we may not be able to transform all of it, but we can produce, again, a lot of protein that we can go in, we can grind up these leaves, and then we can extract that protein for other uses. Whereas with transgenic plants, again, this is the tissue culture that we saw. You can see here that it's been transformed, it's glowing. Once we know that that uh, tissue culture has been transformed, we can actually use different plant hormones to cause it to start to mature and produce other cell types. So that's what we did here. We induced it to start to uh, create uh, stems and leaves. And then eventually we were able to recreate a fully transformed plant. And again, this is valuable because once these plants are transformed, they're fully transformed in all their cell types. And then we can harvest seeds from these plants that also have these traits. So what are the applications for these um, different methods of using agrobacterium? Well, for transient expression, like I said before, we can sort of turn these plants into uh, little factories to produce either medically relevant products or other research relevant products. So the example I have here is actually from uh, research that another uh, previous uh, PhD student, he's since graduated, this is the research that he actually did in our lab, is he worked on producing vaccines in plants. So as you may know, vaccines nowadays commonly they're produced in eggs. And so um, that's how, like for instance, the influenza uh, vaccine uh, is produced. And that can be, have a few issues because one, it takes three months to actually produce that vaccine. And if you, have an alert, if you have an allergy to eggs, you actually can't take that vaccine. So then what are some other alternatives? And so that's why he did these, this research on using plants because obviously plants don't have eggs in them. So people who have egg allergies might be able to use that vaccine, but also it's a much faster process. So as I mentioned before, you do that transient expression where you inject the culture into the plant and then the plant you know, starts to produce your vaccine and then seven to 12 days later, you can go in and harvest that vaccine, you can purify it, and then you can use it uh, to um, inoculate uh, you know, people and animals from these uh, diseases that you want to vaccinate against. So it's a very uh, useful technique. As for transgenic expression, most of that's what's gonna be is crop usage in agriculture for producing you know, hardier crops that have better qualities. So in the U.S., what are the uh, types of transgenic crops that we have available? Well, the GMOs that are currently at market, you have corn, soybeans, cotton, canola, alfalfa, sugar beets, papaya, squash, potato, and apples. So these are the ones that have been modified and are actually sold in stores. But what have they been modified to do? Well, there's several reasons they might have been modified. Uh, one might be, oh, you know, to manage weeds, so to make sure that weeds don't grow up around these plants so that they don't get outcompeted and they can actually grow appropriately. Uh, you can prevent diseases, so you can include disease-resistant genes. That mean that these plants aren't going to fall prey to fungal infections or to different viruses so that we can get a good crop yield. And you can also change the nutritional information, like with the golden rice, where they included more vitamin A in order to make sure that people were getting all the nutrients they, they needed from their food. And then lastly, you can also use plants to control insect populations. And that's what I'm going to focus on because that's the type of research that I do. So what's an example of how plants can be used against pests or different insects? Well, an example you might have heard of is what's referred to as a Bt corn. And Bt corn is a strain of corn that has been engineered to uh, be resistant to pests that like to feed on and destroy the crop. So the way it works is uh, Bt actually stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacteria. This bacteria produces uh, what are known as crystalline or cry toxins. 
And what's special about these toxins is that there are multiple strains, so multiple varieties of these toxins, and each toxin is only uh, lethal, only toxic to a particular insect species. So that means one toxin will kill one insect species but not be able to kill another. So it's great because that means we can get really good specificity against not only different insect species, but it also means that these toxins aren't harmful to humans. So if you were to eat a crop that has this toxin, you'll be just fine. And so what uh, the researchers did for BT corn is they found a crytoxin that works against uh, common like pests and locusts that normally destroy corn, and they included it in the plant's genome. So the plant naturally then produces this corn so that if the insect goes and feeds on the corn, it dies. And so you can kind of see what that looks like here. So over here on the far right, that's an ear of corn that is expressing this gene. You can see that it doesn't have any really obvious damage to it. Whereas if we look over here on the far left, we see this plant that obviously has obvious damage where it's been eaten by an insect. So having this gene not like, you know, helps to preserve the integrity of this plant, which is great for the farmers because uh, then they can, they're still able to sell their crop. And then it's great for people who rely on these crops for food because then they're not going to starve. So it has a lot of good applications. But that's just one way that plants can be used to control insects. So can you guys think of maybe some other ways that plants could be applied to control insects or maybe help insects potentially? Good, that's a good example. Maybe we can, you know, help the pollen, which could potentially help bees uh, who, you know, you can help pollinate plants or you can help maybe maybe express something that the bees could eat and help, you know, help increase their survival. Any other suggestions? Yeah? Yeah, so we, there are multiple applications that we can, you know, help maybe other, um, other animals that are out in the environment. So, but what I'm going to focus on is, in particular, is the connection between plants and mosquitoes. Specifically, how plants can be used to control mosquito populations by killing them. So how to, so before we get into how that works though, why do we want to go after mosquitoes? Well, the reason for that is mosquitoes are currently the deadliest animals to humans, and they've been that way for a long time. What this graph shows is looking at infectious diseases throughout the years, what have been the most common causes of death for humans. And you may notice these two right here, which I'll bring up. We have malaria, and dengue. And what's the thing that they have in common? They're both transmitted by mosquitoes. So mosquitoes have been a problem for a very long time, but they're also still a problem today. So this is data from the World Health Organization. And what they find is that on average, mosquitoes kill 725,000 people each year, which means that they kill more humans than other humans. And actually, that's a low estimate. I've seen some numbers as large as 1 million people per year. Now, you may wonder, how does something so small kill a human. And the reason for that is, like I mentioned before, mosquitoes carry diseases. They're like the little middleman that uh, help to transport, transport a pathogen from one human to another human through the blood. And so mosquitoes are what we call vectors or carriers of several human pathogens. Uh, several examples which include Zika, malaria, elephantiasis, yellow fever, dengue, and uh, West Nile. So they carry a lot of diseases. But one thing that's important to know, obviously we want to go after these mosquitoes because we want to get rid of the diseases that they carry. But when you're designing um, your protocols for getting rid of these diseases, one thing you need to take care of is you need to take note of is that not every single mosquito carries every single disease. It's actually, it's very interesting that each disease is actually carried by very specific mosquitoes. So if we want to go after, say, dengue, we want to make sure that we're targeting Aedes aegypti. But if we want to go after malaria, we need to make sure that we're going after Anopheles mosquitoes. So those are all things that we need to take into consideration. Um, so now we know the problem. So how are we going to solve it? So what's currently available today? Well, the most commonly used method for uh, getting rid of mosquitoes is using pesticides. But unfortunately, pesticides have a lot of problems. In particular, they kill beneficial insect species. So you might have heard in the news like a year or so ago where they spread a pesticide called Nalid in uh, South Carolina and Florida in order to try to kill the Zika carrying mosquitoes that were making it into Florida. Um, they were able to kill the mosquitoes. Unfortunately, they also killed 2.5 million honeybees, which is a really bad problem, not only for people who you know, produce honey, but also bees are important pollinators for other plants to ensure that those plants are able to you know, 
to breed and then also you know, survive. So that's a very bad problem. The other thing is that these uh, pesticides can even cause toxicity in vertebrate species. They can disrupt ecosystems because they leach into the water, which can destroy like the bacteria in there, the algae, all sorts of things, and then make that a non-productive environment. And then ultimately, if we overuse these pesticides, pesticide, you know, insect resistant to these pesticides is a very common issue. So we need to make sure that we have other alternatives that we can use so that we don't get this resistance as well. So what are the other pesticide alternatives? Well, what you see here, um, this man right here, uh, he is uh, treating water uh, for mosquitoes. So as you may know, with mosquitoes, uh, they go through a larval stage before they become the flying menaces that we're more uh, used to. Um, and so that means that they have to live in water. And so if we can treat the water, the standing water where they're located before they become adults, we can kill them before they're able to spread out and cause uh, more problems. Uh, and then down here, what we have are what we call um, um, uh, sugar, um, toxic sugar baits. So mosquito attractive toxic sugar baits. And so this is where you put out uh, sugar solutions for the mosquitoes to feed on, um, and then they feed on and then they die. The problem with these um, methods is that they're often difficult and costly to maintain because they have to be constantly reapplied. You, you have to manually go out and treat all the water. You gotta make sure you get all of the water, first of all. Um, and you know when it runs out, it runs out, you have to go add more. So they're not very um, easy to maintain and it can, you know, it can ring up quite a bill as far as for maintaining these programs. And then what I have over here is showing, you know, the other alternative is you know, if you're in a mosquito prone area, you can use these mosquito bed nets. But that's kind of more like a band-aid for the problem because you know you use this when you sleep in order to protect yourself from mosquitoes. But you know you get a hole in the bed and that's not really going to do you much good. So and also that's you know that's not going to solve the problem of these mosquito populations growing. So we need other alternatives. So now I'm going to switch over into talking more about the research that I do. And particularly, I'm looking at using plants as a solution for controlling mosquito populations. So the idea here is that we have a plant and we use it uh, to deliver toxins to mosquitoes. So the idea is that the mosquito will come in, will feed on the plant. When it feeds on the plant, it'll eat this toxin and then it'll die. And what's great about this is again, we believe that this method will be um, easier to maintain and won't be as costly because with the other methods, you had to constantly go out and reapply uh, these, uh, the toxins. Whereas if you have a plant, you just have to plant it, let it grow, and then the plant naturally produces more of this toxin as it goes on. So that's the idea, but how do we know that it's going to work? Because, you know, it's not obvious the interaction between plants and mosquitoes. Well, the reason for it is actually mosquitoes love nectar. So a common misconception people have is that mosquitoes only feed on blood, and that's not true. Because actually only female mosquitoes feed on blood, and they only want to feed on blood when they want to lay eggs because they lack certain proteins that are necessary for proper egg development. So that means males never feed on blood, and then females, when they don't want to lay eggs, they got to get their food from somewhere else. So where do they get that from? They get that from plants. In particular, they really love nectar. And so that's kind of what you see in these pictures here, various mosquitoes that are uh, feeding off of uh, plant sugar sources. And so now we know, okay, plants are a good option. So how do we choose the perfect plant to modify in order to create these uh, mosquito, to you know, mosquito uh, toxic plants? Well, this is actually research uh, that my advisor has done, um, and he found a good plant to use is impatience because he found it to be highly mosquito attractive and it also produces a lot of nectar. So that's actually the picture you see right here. This is a close-up of uh, the impatience plant, and you'll notice all these little droplets that are all around it. Well, impatient produces a ton of nectar, both in its flowers and also in what we call extra floral nectaries, which are outside of the flowers, and those are located all along its stems and leaves. So it produces lots of nectar. So good, we know, all right, mosquito's probably gonna like this because it produces its food. And then what he also proceeded to do is he did a uh, attraction study. So he looked to see, you know, he had several different nectar producing plants and he wanted to see which one were the mosquitoes actually going to prefer? Which one are they gonna go and really, really like to feed on? What one was most attractive? And what we found down here is that impatience was most attractive. You can see that illustrated here with these bar graphs, is the higher the bar, the more attractive it was. And as you can see, impatience right here and here, all of the bars are significantly taller than all the other ones. So impatience was you know, not only more attractive than other species like Rakanus and Cam uh, Campsis radicans, but it was even more preferred than straight sugar, like straight like sugar solutions. So it was a very attractive plant. So that was very exciting. So now we know we have a plant that we wanna use, 
But you know, now that we have the plant, how do we get the plant to express a toxin? Specifically, we want that toxin to be in the nectar. Oh well, actually, before I get onto that, another reason why impatience is a good model to use is because they also share similar habitats with mosquitoes. So what you see here in the, these two graphs, um, the red indicates where mosquitoes are located. The darker the red color, the more uh, the denser the mosquito population is in that area. And then what the black circles indicate are where impatience has been shown to grow in the wild. And you can see that those habitats directly overlap with one another. And that's a good thing because it would be, it would be a problem if we go through all this effort to create this, uh, you know, this toxic plant and then it's not able to actually grow on the areas where the mosquitoes are more prominent and also particularly the areas where disease carrying mosquitoes are more prominent. So it's important that it be able to grow and so it's good news that our plant seems to be able to survive those environments. Um, but it also is a thing that if they are naturally out there in the wild, mosquitoes have probably encountered these plants, so they'll probably be more um, uh, prone to actually feeding on it, which is a good thing. So after I got a little ahead of myself, now you're wondering, okay, patience is a good plant. How do we actually get nectar expression of our toxins? Well, to get nectar expression, it's going to require two things. We're going to need a promoter and we're going to need a signal peptide. So why do we need a promoter? Well, you may have asked the question before, if all of my cells have the exact same copy of DNA, why are my cells different depending on what tissue they're located in? And the answer is that not every single gene that your DNA has is uh, being expressed at the same time in all of your cells. And part of the reason for that are what we call promoters, which are sort of the on-off switches for gene expression. So promoters are located upstream of your gene. Um, and then they are basically the binding site for the uh, enzyme known as RNA polymerase. This is the enzyme it binds, and then it starts to produce RNA. That RNA then gets translated to protein, and then that protein goes on to dictate the purpose of that cell and the particular tissue where it's located. So, you know, if we're going to get expression in the nectar, that means we need to find a promoter that is active in the nectary. But that's only part of the issue because okay, our protein's being produced in nectary tissue, but how do we guarantee that it actually makes it out into the nectar? Well, that's where we need signal peptides. So when you have a protein, which is illustrated here, we have our N-terminus and we have our C-terminus. This portion here that's located on the far end of the N-terminus, or the far um, left portion of our protein, is what we call a signal peptide, and it's in front of the rest of the protein. And the signal peptide is basically a barcode a shipping address or like a train ticket that tells the protein where it needs to go. And that's what I have illustrated in this diagram here. So here we have our protein that is being produced by the ribosome. And as it's being produced, it has its signal peptide here, which is out front. That signal peptide gets recognized by the, sort of the, the ticket master of the cell known as the signal recognition particle. So that protein will bind the signal peptide and will direct it to where it needs to go. So in this case, because this protein wants to be secreted, it gets directed to the endoplasmic reticulum. So once it gets uh, directed there, another protein binds it, and then the rest of the protein gets, as it's produced, it gets pushed into the ER. And then once the full protein is produced, the uh, signal peptide actually gets cleaved off, and then the protein is free floating so that it can then be transported through vesicles to make it outside of the cell. So that's why we need signal peptides. So how does that all come together inside of a nectary? Well, that's what I have illustrated here. So uh, this uh, purple dot you see uh, that says CRC, that's one example of a uh, nectary promoter. And so, you know, that nectary promoter is active in different nectary uh, cells. And so it becomes active and then boom, it starts to produce your protein. And then the protein also has a signal peptide and that signal peptide causes it to move around until eventually it'll make it out into these vesicles right here which allow it to be transported outside of the cell. Once it's outside of the cell, it can be secreted out into the nectar because that extracellular space is directly connected to the nectar so it can make it outside. So that's how we sort of integrate it together. So we know we need uh, promoters and signal peptides. So, but the, you know, that's a, all well, but how do you know which one you want to use? Well, for our research, um, what we have found with nectary promoters, we can either use native ones so ones that we ex uh, experimentally determine ourselves from that are actually already in the impatience plant that we want to change. Um, but we also have found that you can actually use non-native promoters. So promoters that come from other plants, such as Arabidopsis, because a lot of these promoter elements are highly conserved. 
um, between plant species because they're close to related. And so usually if one promoter has one function, such as production in a nectary, it's most likely going to have the same function in another plant. Because again, these, uh, these uh, elements don't change much. So for uh, our research, uh, we decided to choose two non-native promoters, and then we also decided to go after two native promoters. The reason we did that uh, is because, you know, we wanted to make sure that if we're developing our expression model in impatience for these toxins, we want to make sure we choose the best promoter possible. So we have multiple different options, we make all of them, and then we say which one is producing our protein at the highest level. Which, you know, it seems most likely that the native promoter will probably be the one that will do it, but you never know. Maybe the non-native one might work better once it actually makes it into impatience. So that's why we decided to go after uh, both of those. So starting with the non-native promoters, we've actually already created some of these plants, and we found that indeed these non-native promoters do work in impatience. Um, so I'm going to break down uh, what these pictures are showing, but basically what we had is we chose again our two non-native promoters, which are CRC, which is the promoter that produces crab's claw in Arabidopsis, and then C1B4, which produces the uh, protein cell wall invertase 4 in Arabidopsis. And then we use those promoters to express the protein known as GUS. Now GUS is a color metric protein. It's a common indicator used in plant research because plants do not naturally produce this protein. So if you see any GUS expression in plants, it's because you put it there. And the way we test for GUS expression is that uh, we expose it to a chemical, specifically x -gluc, and if GUS is present, it will turn blue. But if it's not present, you won't get any color change at all. And so when we transform these plants, we actually included two different genes. Not only did we include our nectary promoter and GUS, we also wanted to include uh, GFP. And the reason for that is nectaries don't develop until the plant is fully mature, which is a roughly a six-month process. So that means from the point that we transform it with the agrobacterium, six months later, that's when we can start you know, testing the nectaries. But that is way too long, because imagine if you uh, did the transformation experiment, and then you get there and you realize, oh my god, the transformation didn't even work from the very start. So how can we control for that potential problem? And that's why we also included GFP, which causes this green fluorescence or causes it to glow green. And the reason we included GFP is because after we expose the tissue culture to the bacteria, this expression shows up as early as three days after inoculation. So that's a good time because we know, oh hey, that protein's being produced and because that gene was included at the same time as the other gene, we know if this uh, gene is present, then this one also made it in as well. So that allows us to know that, okay, this plant tissue is transformed. So if we don't see expression later on, we know it's a problem with the promoter and not a problem with the transformation. So we were able, we had our successful transformation, and then we were able to check the nectaries um, later once they were fully mature. And what you see with these pictures, the ones that are over here on the left, these are wild type plants, which means these are just native impatients. They haven't been transformed at all. And then the ones that you see over here, uh, these are ones that have been transformed. And again, we're looking for gusts, so we're looking for uh, blue stain. And you can see over here in the wild type, we don't see any blue color, because again, plants don't naturally produce gusts. But this is a result that we got with both CRC and C1V4. You can see here the tissue has turned blue. So not only is it expressing, this is a nectary that we cut off, not only is it expressing gus in its nectary, but we were actually able to collect some of the nectar and we were able to stain the nectar as well. And we found blue crystals, which tells us not only is it being produced in the nectary tissue, but it also made it out into the nectar. So that shows again that non-native promoters work. But that's only part of what we wanted to do because remember, we want to create the optimal expression model, so we also want to you know, get some of the native promoters to see if maybe they work better. But unfortunately for us, the impatience genome is not sequenced. So if we want to find these promoters, we're going to have to go and find them ourselves. So how are we going to isolate these promoters? Well, you may have heard of the central dogma of biology, which is that you start with DNA, DNA produces RNA, and then RNA produces protein, which is something that can you know, obviously be collected very well at the end. But if that's the process, could potentially we reverse that process, start with the protein, and backtrack it to the DNA that it originally came from? And that's what we decided to do. So we started with protein sequencing. So we collected nectar from impatients, we looked for protein samples that were making it out into the nectar, and then we used a process called mass spectrometry 
to determine the amino acid potential amino acid sequences for these proteins. Once we had that, we needed something to compare them to. So we also did RNA-seq. So we collected nectary tissue, and then we sequenced all of the RNA in that tissue to accomplish two goals. One, we wanted to determine which promoters were most active in that nectary tissue, and we can measure that because the most active ones produce the most copies of RNA, which can be easily quantified. But then we also wanted to take those RNAs that we sequenced and then sort of, um, you know, mechanically, virtually, uh, translate it into what its protein sequence would be. Once we had that protein sequence, we can compare it to the protein sequences that uh, we got from the nectar, and so we can determine which RNA was actually producing that protein. And then once we have that gene identified, we can use that as a template to use a process called inverse PCR, which allows us to uh, amplify unknown regions that are either upstream or downstream of your known template. Um, and then once you've amplified those regions, you can send them off for genomic you can send them off for DNA sequencing. But that's a basic overview. I'm going to explain how each of those procedures work. So with mass spec, what did we do to get those protein sequences? Well, we started with our plant which has all these little nectar droplets. We collected a lot of the nectar, and then we purified it, and we ran it on a protein gel, also called an SDS page gel. And what we can see, there are a couple different proteins that are present in the nectar, but the one we were particularly interested in was this one here that was roughly 23 kilodaltons in size because it is very abundant. And so what that tells us is, well, if that's very abundant, that means it probably has a very active promoter. So maybe that's the promoter we want to go after. So we actually literally cut that band out of the gel and purify the protein from that gel, and then we fragmented it so that we could send it through the mass spec. So how does a mass spec work? The mass uh, spectrometer, the way it works is it uh, analyzes, uh, it can be used to analyze multiple things. In this case, we are analyzing proteins, and each amino individual amino acid has its own unique mass to charge ratio, which is what the mass uh, spec looks for. And so each individual amino acid has its own unique uh, mass, um, mass to charge ratio, and then also, depending on how these amino acids are aligned with one another, that also produces unique patterns. So we can use all of those uh, unique uh, values to determine not only the amino acids that are present, but also how they're, we can predict maybe how they're arranged in accordance with one another so that we can get a predicted amino acid sequence. And these are uh, some of the amino acid sequences that we were able to generate. So now that we have the protein sequence for our nectar protein, now we need the RNA sequence to compare it to. So we did uh, RNA sequencing. So actually, not only did we collect RNA from nectary tissue, we also uh, collected it from stem and leaf, because not only did we want a promoter that was highly active in the nectary, we wanted one that was um, selectively active in the nectary. So one that was more active in the nectary versus other tissue types. Um, and so the nectary uh, expression is indicated with the black bars. And we found that there were two uh, RNAs that were produced more than any other, two very active promoters. And those were ones that produced uh, homologs of proteins that are known as phyloplanin and sweet 14. Phyloplanin is an antifungal protein. And then sweet 14 is a sugar transporter. So it makes sense that that one would be uh, in the nectary because it's transporting sugar. So we had these uh, two. So we know, OK, these are two highly active promoters. But then we looked at the RNA sequence that we got back. We translated it to what the protein sequence would be, and then we compared those protein sequences to the predicted sequences that we got from mass spec. And we found a match. So the sequence over here, the very long one that's on top, that's the sequence for phyloplanin. Um, and then the ones that are below it, these are the mass spec fragments. And so we found for a lot of our mass spec fragments here and here and here, we found a lot of them li lined up directly with the the phyloplanin sequence. And so we were able to say, OK, from this data, it looks like that that protein that is making out into nectar is phyloplanin. So that means that's a promoter we definitely want to go after. But it also makes sense physiologically that phyloplanin would be in the nectar because it is an antifungal protein. So a common problem for plants, particularly ones that produce nectar, is that you know what also likes nectar? Fungi. And they have the, the bad um, problem of going in getting on the plant, overgrowing the plant, and then killing it. So obviously, the plant does not want a fungus to be able to grow on it, so it produces this antifungal protein in order to prevent that. So now we have uh, our key candidate that we want to go after, the key promoter. But we also decided, again, we wanted two, so we're going to do phyloplanin and also sweet 14, because it's a 
good chance that, you know, maybe the Sweet 14 one, it might actually work better. So we're going after those two. But how are we, now that we know the promoter what we want to go after, how do we isolate that promoter? And the answer is we are using a process called inverse PCR, which is indicated by uh, this uh, diagram here. And I'm going to go through each individual step so you can understand it. So the way it starts is we have our known sequence. So for us, this known sequence is going to be the RNA that we've collected, because that's basically a reflection of what the gene is going to be in the DNA. Once we have this known sequence, we design our primers, like with regular PCR. You might be familiar with regular PCR. Uh, regular PCR also makes these primers, um, but the primers face toward each other so that they can amplify a known region, create multiple copies of it. Inverse PCR, as the name suggests, is the reverse. Instead of the primers facing each other, they actually face away from each other so that they'll move out and amplify unknown regions. So once we, you know, we've designed our primers, the other important thing is we want to determine, well, do we want to amplify the unknown upstream region or the unknown downstream region? So we're interested in going after the promoter, so we want the upstream region. So that means that we uh, need to pay attention to the restriction enzyme that we use. Because obviously we don't want to amplify the entire plant genome, so we want to sort of, you know, cut up the genome into usable fragments, and that's where restriction enzymes come into place. So we choose a restriction enzyme that is downstream of our primers so that the, we're not, uh, you know, amplifying and sequencing the downstream, unknown downstream region. That way all that we're getting is this upstream region that we want. So we uh, choose a restriction enzyme. We want to choose one that only occurs once in our known region, but we also want to make sure that it's a, what we call a rare enzyme. What that means is that um, it recognizes usually six nucleotides or more, and then it recognizes those nucleotides and it'll go in and it'll cut the DNA. Once we've uh, identified the restriction enzyme that we want, then we uh, take our genome, and you can illustrate here that again, it's a rare enzyme, so it doesn't occur quite often throughout the genomic DNA. And then we cut the genomic DNA with that enzyme, and so it creates all these manifold fragments. And then once we have these fragments, we cause them to self-ligate with one another. So what is ligation? Ligation is where you have your sticky ends, your cut ends, that are left over by uh, the restriction enzyme, and then they glue themselves back together. Instead of being, so instead of being linear DNA, they turn into these circular pieces of DNA, which can be used as templates for PCR. And so that's very useful, because once we've created these um, circular pieces of DNA, we can actually use our primers. So like I said before, the inverse primers are facing away from each other, but now that we've created this circular plasmid, we can actually allow them to come together so that now they'll actually go towards each other and they'll amplify this black region, which is our unknown region, the upstream region that we're after. And it'll create a PCR product that looks like this, where you have your unknown region here in the middle flanked by your known region, and then once you have that, you can send that off for sequencing. When you get the nucleotide sequence back, um, you can say, oh, okay, there's the known region that I know, and then you can fit that unknown region in the spot where it would be uh, in the genome. So it's a way to sort of determine those unknown regions. But unfortunately for us, our known DNA, the template that we're working off of is not straight genomic DNA, which means that we have something that we have to be careful of, and those are going to be introns. So you may be uh, familiar with intron splicing. But when a gene is used to produce RNA, the first product that it actually produces is what's called pre-RNA. And what's uh, indicative of pre-RNA is it still contains these intron regions that don't uh, get later expressed. And the reason for that is, is you have the spliceosome that comes in and cuts out this intron in order to create the mature mRNA. And this is what we got from RNA-seq, is this mature mRNA. So that means from that sequence, we don't know where these introns are located. And that's a problem when we're designing our primers. So let's say the cut, you know, the intron was located right here. We need to make sure that we don't design a primer that overlaps where that intron exon junction is, because while this is what we have, this is the actual template that we're going to be working off of, is the actual genome. And that's a problem, because if there's an intron, if our primer overlaps an intron, part of the primer is going to bind here, part of it may bind here. And if, you, if your primer doesn't bind completely, it can't actually anneal properly, and then it's not actually going to amplify, so you get no product at all. So we need to make sure that we avoid those intron regions. So how do we do that if we don't know our plant's genome? So what we did is we actually looked at the closest relatives of our protein. So this is a protein that is present in a lot of different plants. 
and a lot of its uh, components are highly conserved, including its uh, exon intron junctions. So what we did is we took the uh, protein sequences for both phyloplanin and sweet 14, and we did a BLAST analysis. BLAST is a ba the basic local alignment search tool. It's a tool that is available online, um, and you can compare your sequence to find its closest relatives that have a very similar sequence to it. And so these were all of the closest relatives that we found for phyloplanin. And what we found is that for all of them, the, um, the exon and intron junction was in the exact same place for all of them. So it was a highly conserved region. And so we were able to determine from that information that our protein has two exons and that that exon and intron junction is located right there. And then we also did the same for uh, sweet 14. We found that it had, f oh, sorry. We found that it had five exons with various exon intron junctions. And we've even confirmed that those are actually where they're located because we've again done some sequencing on this, on the actual genome a little bit, and we found that those exon intron junctions were exactly where we predicted they would be. So this is a very valuable tool if you know the type of template that you're working with so that you can avoid these problems. So now that we, you know, we've avoided these issues, we've designed our primers, now we can start working on doing inverse PCR and getting some of the sequence. And so far, from what we have, we've actually gotten part of a promoter. So we have, so far, obtained 683 base pairs of sweet 14, as you see here. But now that we have that sequence, how do we know that that's actually part of the promoter? Well, we can use online uh, computer programs, such as Plant Care, which will analyze our sequence for these little regions here, which are highly conserved promoter elements that are conserved throughout all plant species. And you can see those are what all listed there. And so because all of these elements are present, we have a good at part that we have at least part of the promoter. So again, I say part because a lot of promoters can be anywhere from this size up to 3,000 base pairs. So we still have a lot of work that we do, but we're headed in the right direction. So what still needs to be done? Well, we still need to determine the promoter for phyloplanin using inverse PCR, which is what we're currently working on now. And then also on top of that, we also need to get the rest of the Sweet 14 promoter. Um, once we have those promoters, uh, we will create constructs with varying lengths of the sequences that we get to make sure, again, that we have the full promoter region. And also that makes sure if there are any other elements that we need an enhanced expression, we want to make sure we include those. So we create our, our recombinant plasmids. Once we have those, then we transform them into impatience so that the impatience will express these native promoters. And then we can compare those expression uh, levels to non-native promoter plants to see which one is our overall best expression model. So we know which promoter is going to produce the most protein in our plant so that we can then go in and replace like GUS or maybe GFP with the toxin that we want to later express. So how does again all this come together for my project? So the goal of my project is that I want to create uh, an impatience nectar delivery system that will express mosquito specific toxins. What do I need to do that? First, I need to develop an optimal uh, nectar expression model in patients by looking at various promoters to see which one works best. Once I've determined that best model, my next step after this research that I talked about is I'm going to express toxins uh, in the plants. And then once I express those toxins, I'm going to see which ones ultimately actually kill mosquitoes. So that's all that I have for my presentation. Are there any questions? Yes. Say what? How long is your school? Uh, for PhD or for undergrad? Uh, so for me, as an undergraduate, I went to St. Louis University, go Billikens. Um, I was, um, I did the typical four-year track, so I graduated within four years with a Bachelor of Science uh, in uh, Cell Biology and Physiology. I also got a Spanish minor. Um, so that was typical track. Um, I actually, when I was an undergrad, I didn't know that I wanted to do research when I went in. I thought maybe I wanted to do med school. But then I realized that wasn't really the track for me because when I did my labs, I went in and I found, oh, I kind of like this. I'd be spending hours working on a project and it didn't feel like wasted time at all. So that helped me to realize, oh, maybe this is the career path that I want to choose. And so I actually didn't know that I wanted to do research until I was a junior in college. And so once there, I started connecting myself and I went out and I wanted to you know, do research because I wanted to get experience. And that's where I started out actually doing research with cancer vaccines. I did research at uh, Washington University's uh, medical school in uh, St. Louis. 
because uh, they had a connection with uh, my university. And what they were working on is they were working on uh, creating vaccines against breast cancer and against prostate cancer um, in order to see if they could redirect the immune system to start actually killing the cancer so that they could reinvigorate the immune system to actually do its job, which is to kill the cancer cells. Um, but I realized that, you know, I thought I liked immunology, but then you actually get in and do it and you're like, oh, okay, maybe I don't like working, you know, with mice or maybe I don't like working with cell cultures. And so that I realized wasn't the research for me, but I did know that I wanted to continue doing research. So it felt like the next logical step was to go on and get a PhD, um, you know, to go on and do graduate school. And so that's how I ended up at Baylor. And so the way I determined Baylor is I actually looked at several programs and I found a professor whose research I found interesting. And for me, that was Dr. Kearney, because what he does is he takes a look at plants and he, can see, he sees how plants can be used to solve a variety of problems, such as producing vaccines in plants or producing uh, antimicrobial peptides in plants, which these AMPs are potential antibiotic alternatives to help solve you know, the issue, the antibiotic crisis that we're getting in because a lot of bacteria are now resistant to antibiotics. And then you had my project, which is um, creating plants that kill mosquitoes in order to decrease their populations so that they're less likely to spread disease. So that's how I chose my program. And then here I am, four years later, still working on my project, and we're making good headway. So it's a good question. Are there any other questions? Okay, so that, that's it for questions. Um, I actually have a little uh, hands-on thing that you guys can do. Uh, so like I mentioned before, one thing we like to do is we, one type of transformation we do is transient expression where we inject the plant. Of course, again, we inject it with a culture. Um, obviously, I can't bring bacteria in here because that violates biosafety laws. Um, so, but you can inject water, which is a good way to practice to see if, uh, you know how to inject the plant. So before we begin, I actually have a video prepared that you can actually watch uh, to see how the process actually works. Come on. So this is how we do uh, injections, also referred to as agro-infiltration. So here we have our plant, which we have back here. You take the plant, you turn the leaf over because you're interested in the underside. As you can see, behind the plant, they have their finger right here, and then the syringe, they're pushing where their finger is beside the plant, so they're connecting the two. And then they start to push the plunger to inject the liquid into the plant, which is so slowly spreading away from the site of injection. The important thing here is when you're putting the syringe on the plant, make sure you don't push through the plant. You wanna make sure that it's resting against the plant leaf, but not going all the way through. You wanna create a complete seal so that the water actually moves into the plant. Until eventually, boom, you have the culture all in the leaf. So that's how you do it. So now we'll go ahead and we'll get our little hands-on thing uh, ready for you guys. Okay. So these plants that I brought with you are research, brought with me are research plants uh, known as Nicotiana benthamiana. They are a relative of the tobacco plant but they are commonly used to do this type of experiment because they express foreign proteins very well because they have a weak immune system, which means that we can foreign express them. Because normally plants don't want to express foreign things because that usually means they've been infected with a virus or a fungus. But because they have a very weak immune system, uh, we can actually uh, infect them. So I'll do one quick demonstration real quick and then you guys can come up and try it for yourself. And then you pick a leaf that you want, and then you press it up against it. And then you, oh, maybe this isn't going to work because these aren't the right syringes, but, oh, it's going a little. Uh, you have to make sure it's a good seal, and then you press. And as you can see, the water has moved to the plant. So be careful when you're using the syringes. It might leak a little bit. So it's important to make sure, again, that you get a good, uh, good seal. So again, press up tightly, and then you can press the water into the leaf like that. So you can learn this is part of the research that we do to do transient expression. So if you don't have any further questions, you can come up and you can try for yourself. Uh, we have uh, syringes that are up here in the water. 
Um, and then also, if you would like to ask me any other questions during this time, you are more than welcome to do so as well. And that's it. Thank you.